What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. So good to see you guys on this last Sunday in September for the year 2021. Is that right? Okay, that's where we are. Um, so good to see you. If you would, grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Philippians chapter 2. As was aforementioned, we're in a uh, verse-by-verse study through the book of Philippians. And if you're new to Coastline or maybe somewhat familiar with Calvary Chapel or been in one on the West Coast or somewhere before, you may be familiar that it's really our, kind of our rhythm on Sunday mornings to make church about Jesus. Is that a good thing for you? Okay, good. You never know. Some people know that's not what they're here for. Um, but it, it really is about Jesus. And we really do believe that God has given us his word to be his inspired, infallible, inerrant communication from, there's a book titled this, From God to Us. Um, it's where he communicates his character, where he communicates who his son is, and who you are. I love the Bible. Such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gift. And so this morning, as with many Calvary chapels and specifically the Coastline family of churches here in Gulf Breeze, Navarre, and Destin, we, we typically spend a Sunday morning navigating a portion of Scripture in a, in a verse-by-verse manner where we just simply seek to explain the text and then expose how Jesus is always the central figure. And so this morning in Philippians chapter 2, just looking at the first 11 verses, um, we're in this series entitled, Jesus is the Key to Joy. But here's how I would entitle our time together this morning. It's a little weird, but that's okay. Just hang with me for the next two, three dozen minutes or so, and hopefully we can unpack it. But this is what I would say our title is for our time together this morning. Maybe people aren't the problem. Maybe Jesus is. You go, whoa, what does that mean? I think Philippians chapter 2 shows us. Maybe people aren't the problem. Maybe Jesus is? Maybe Jesus is? I don't think we have to spend much time this morning attempting to awaken our senses to the importance and the relevancy of the text before us this morning. The theme is unity. Unity. I don't believe there are many among us who would not agree that we live in a discouraging, discomforting, divided, unkind, and mean culture. See, what, what? Have you ever tried to sell anything on Facebook Marketplace? Yeah, so you know. You see, in chapter one, we learn that the secret of joy in challenging circumstances is a singleness of mind. Well, my goal is not that circumstances would, would serve me, but that circumstances would serve Jesus. Therefore, I endure. Therefore, I'm not subservient to circumstance. Circumstance is subservient to me. Because my singleness of mind is this. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. That's the best way to live. How do you navigate challenging circumstances? Recognize that life is not about you and your dreams and your desires, your comforts, your goals. It's about Jesus. Wonderful thing about Jesus is Jesus isn't mean. Jesus isn't unkind. Jesus isn't someone who is discouraging. Jesus is one who gave himself for you. And if God, through his son Jesus, gave us Jesus, how shall he not freely give us all good things for us? The character of God is good. Challenging circumstances aren't there to hurt you. They're there to help you. 
focus on that which is primary, on that which actually gives life, a relationship with God and a healthy relationship with others. Chapter one, we navigated and learned together that the secret of joy in challenging circumstances is a singleness of mind on Jesus. Well, in chapter two, we have the opportunity to learn that the secret of joy with challenging people is a submissive mind. Say, where are you getting this awesome alliteration? Not from me. There's a guy named Warren Wearsby who wrote a book called Be Joyful. It's just a commentary. It's, it's a supplemental resource that we're using in our connect groups for discussion questions. Like if you're in a small group and you're kind of getting together to learn God's word together, to fellowship, to pray, to encourage one another, and you're tracking along with our Sunday morning gatherings, well, there's discussion questions that help unpack. And here's the wonderful thing about Warren Wearsby. He's not Jesus. <laughs> not everything he says is like the Bible. It's just supplemental. It's just helpful just a a helpful resource to navigate some discussion questions. But he has this outline through Philippians chapters one, two, three, and four that alliterate. And if you know me, I kind of like alliteration. Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, Leonidas, Laney. That's where we are with our children. So when he alliterated, I was like, wow, this is my guy, you know. But in this second chapter, here is your opportunity today, next week, Let's just take a quick poll. Has anyone ever met a challenging person? Well, let me ask you this question. Do you have a mirror? No, there you go, right? Like, there's a challenge, right? Sometimes the challenge is right here. Or here. Or here. But we won't go there. Um, Challenging people. They're there. All you have to do is look in the mirror. There, There he is every day. So how do you have joy? Well, here's what I'd say. Maybe the problem isn't challenging people. Maybe the problem is with Jesus. Jesus? Now hang with me. Obviously we know Jesus isn't the problem. So what does this mean? A submissive mind. In in Philippians chapter 1, it's Jesus comes first. In Philippians chapter 2, it's others come second. Wearsby actually says in his book, I liked this. He said in chapter 1, Paul's the soul winner. In chapter 2, he's the servant. And in chapter 2, he begins to call his friends. If you know anything about the church in Philippi, I'd encourage you to listen to that first message that Pastor John gave. It's on the YouTube or any of the podcasts where he kind of unpacks who these people are. These aren't some like, oh yeah, those people in Philippi. These are people that he knew, that he loved. It had been 10 years since he'd seen them. But look at chapter 1, verses 27 through 28. It sets up chapter 2. He says this in verse 27 and 28 of chapter 1. If you're there, let me know by saying Jesus is the key to joy. Jesus is the key to joy. Listen to verse 27. He says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come to see you or again or I only hear about you, listen to what he says, I'll know that you're standing as one together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together. For the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated anyway by your enemies, he goes on in verse 28. But in verse 27, he starts to transition to this discussion of unity. So we all kind of raised our hand that we've encountered challenging people, right? Let me ask you a second question. Have you ever navigated disunity with a challenging person? None of you. All right, well, I would love to learn how you do this. Well, there's a biblical way to navigate unity. In chapter two, here's what he's going to tell us this morning, why you should care about unity and how to go about having unity. Man, I I like that. I I like knowing like, well, why is this important? Why why should I matter, right? People are only in your life for a season, so blow them off. If If they like hurt you or do something to you, just forget about them. Move on. Some people live that way. They live with ghosts. The relationship is dead, but the person is not. It's a terrible way to live, to be haunted by that. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live with ghosts. 
Why is unity important? And then the other question, show me how. Show me how. Well, verse 1 and 2, here's the why. Paul writes of chapter, in chapter 2, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. It's like Paul is saying, aren't you encouraged? Doesn't it warm your heart to know that you have been bought with a price? You belong to Jesus. You're no longer a slave to sin. This is the question, and you don't have to answer this verbally, but make a mental yes or no. Does the fact that you're forgiven, loved, adored, and not in bondage, bring any kind of encouragement to your heart? Then the next question would be, aren't you comforted by the fact that he loves you with an everlasting, unconditional love that knows no bounds? Yeah, that's right. Hasn't the Holy Spirit, who is in each of you, bears witness to the fact that you are all children of God if your faith is in Christ, caused you to have sweet fellowship with him and with others? If you're a believer, the answer is, well, yes. And haven't your hearts been made tender and compassionate? Because that's who God has been to you. The answer to all these questions should be in the affirmative. Yes. Yes, that's who God has been to me, and it's changed me from the inside out. Then this is what Paul writes. If you have experienced these benefits of the gospel, it only makes sense that you live consistent with, suitable to, and worthy of those things. Not to earn them, but because you have them. Paul is urging them to bring into the practical where they are, in the positional. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, a lot of the New Testament won't make sense to you. Because this is a lot of what Paul does over and over and over. He's like, listen, you're a king's kid. That's who you are. You don't have to earn that. You've been brought into that standing. Now live that way. Think like a king's kid. Behave like a king's kid. He's urging them to be true to who they are. In Christ. Because we have been loved much, we love much. Because we have been made at peace with God, we become peacemakers with people. Because we have been accepted, we accept those who are different from us. Because we have been forgiven. Much, we forgive those who hurt us much. Because we have been united to God in Christ, we unite with one another around Christ. And Paul describes this unity. He says this is what it looks like in verse 2. It's like like like-mindedness. What is like-mindedness? Is that drone? Is that mindlessness? No. Nope. It means each person sees life through the right lens. What's the right lens? This is the right lens. This is what it means to be like-minded. You can grow your hair long or cut it short. You can be fully sleeved or fully clean, whatever it is. You can love vegan or you just cannot wait to get over to five guys. Does not mean that you are the same. And your choices of every minutia of life, but the vision, mission, and values of your life are the same. Because this determines what life is, why it is, how it is, who it should be about. This is like mindedness. We see things from the same perspective. That day is gone in America. I mean, let me say this again it's gone. 
Stop grasping for something that is not there. It's gone. Now move forward. Love, he says. Each believer will want whatever is best for their brother and sister. This is how. He says of one of cord. This is the kind of unity. What, this is what one of cord means. I am willing to change my ideas if they're wrong. Of one mind means you're wanting the same thing. God's purpose is to be revealed and fulfilled. This is the kind of unity Paul is writing for. He says, I want there to be one mindset. What's the one mindset? We want God's will done. What's the accord? Listen, if, I, if I'm out of alignment to this, I will change. It should be love. Where I, I want what's best for you, not just what's good for me. And like-mindedness, what does that mean? This corrects or confirms decisions. See, here's the deal. You remove the foundation of truth 60, 70 years ago. Where did you think we would end up? This didn't happen overnight. It's always a slow fade. Always, always. Truth is absolute for all people at all places at all times. And yet there was a generation that wouldn't fight that fight. And because we lost that fight, then each one can do what's right in their own eyes. So Paul now says, this is why you should have unity, because you've been loved, <laughs> because you have the Holy Spirit, because there's encouragement. Now how? Isn't this where it gets tricky? Like I heard a leader say this week, see, I can communicate these truths, but to live these is a whole different thing. Well, do we really need more calculated communicators? Or do we need leaders, men and women, that through integrity and simple choices can lead? I heard someone say this week that on the same day, Princess Diana and Mother Teresa both died. Both celebrities. One is inaccessible to all humanity. One is accessible to all humanity. Princess Diana is inaccessible. She married a bloodline that most of us probably won't, you know, kind of enter into by marriage. She had a certain look that most of us may not have. Teresa, not a perfect person, but went for decades without being known. Made choices that, you know, don't like make for a popular social media feed. And I'm not here to speak to all of the dynamics of Mother Teresa, but I am here to speak to this. But she did choose to serve others. You can do that. She did choose to serve. But that pathway to celebrity is long and hard. But who do you want the applause of at the end of the day? My goal, the biblical goal is this. Well done, Amen. good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And you can have that. It's worth so much more than what Kanye or Kim think about you. They probably don't even think about you, you know. But Jesus does. Jesus does. Live for him. So Paul now writes how to pursue this unity. Look at verses three and four. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In these two verses, he shares the negative and the positive. Good parenting right here. Don't be ambitious or conceited. Liam, do not take the sword and hit Leo in the mouth. Okay. But put the sword down. There's the negative. There's the positive. Here's the negative and the positive. Looks, listen. Don't be ambitious or conceited, but be humble. Okay. Don't be self-centered, but seek the interests of others. 
All right, that's it. We can close our Bibles and go. That's how you do it, okay? No, no, no. Let's unpack that. He gives a step-by-step process. Here it is. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. What does that mean? The desire for self-advancement or promotion over another. You can make this the goal of your profession or just the goal of a conversation. You ever met those people? There's a comedian that calls him the me monster. I think his name is uh, Brian Regan. But he talks about how you can be in a conversation with someone and they're like, oh, I did this. Oh, I did this. I did this. I did that. He says, what are the guys say that walked on the moon? You know, like they just kind of let that me monster go. And he just talks and talks and talks and talks. And then he says, you know, well, when I was on the sea of tranquility, and it's like, oh, well, that just killed it right there. Who's can, who can compete with that? But there are people that do that, right? In conversation. You could just be talking about, yeah, I got, I got a cup over the other day. Well, I got two. Okay. <laughs> I was just talking about the cup, but like, but this is a thing where there is selfish ambition, the advancement, the elevation, the promotion of self over another person. He says, don't do that. Now, does this say all ambition is bad? No, not all ambition is bad. Is it bad to say, well, gosh, I'd like to make a good living? No, that's not bad. Man, I'd like to marry a a, a good person. That's a good ambition. I'd like to make a contribution to my community through the way that I live. These are great things. But selfish ambition, no. Put that to death. He says, let nothing be done through conceit. What is conceit? Thinking too highly of oneself or having an excessive self-interest and self-preoccupation or empty glory. You know, if you look at dictionary.com for a picture of conceit, here's the picture you'll see right here. Right? You remember him? John Stamos, his uncle Jesse from Full House. If you don't know, then you don't know. But like in the 90s, this was the guy that was like, yeah, hey, you know? No, it's just a joke. Obviously, that guy's not in the dictionary.com. But it's that dynamic of an excessively favorable opinion of one's ability. Now, here's the deal. Some of us are too savvy to say that directly, but often we say it passive aggressively, right? Like we try to make ourselves look good by putting down somebody else. This is pervasive in every head, every marriage, every family, every church, every community, every business where there's an insecurity, where you say, I just don't know if I'm enough. So the way to satisfy, the way to put gravel into that Grand Canyon of my heart is to tear you down. He says this, no. One author said this, when we live with the feeling that we are more capable or important or talented, we are out of God's will. We are working against what God wants in our lives. And most of us are too savvy to say that directly. But indirectly, passive aggressively, we might say it all the time. Say, man, this is a bummer. How do we have joy? This Bible stuff is tough. Well, then he goes on. Point number three, he says, in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. Listen, you may not catch the Greek context that Paul, the audience that he's writing to, like the culture, the mindset of that time. One person wrote this, that for the Greeks, lowliness of mind was a fault. It was not a virtue. The pagan and secular idea of manhood was self-assertive, imposing one's will on others. When anyone stooped to others, he only did so under compulsion, and that act was even considered disgraceful. Charles Spurgeon wrote this about this passage. He said, the apostle knew that to create concord, unity, you need first to beget a lowliness of mind. Men do not like this. This is why men do not quarrel when their ambitions have come to an end. I like that. In lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. I never forget being in Bible college. One of my professors said, you know how this would work out today just in this room? Yeah, there's two exits there, two exits there, and two exits there. 
But if it was time to exit, and let's say there was only one door, those that are esteeming others better than themselves would never leave because they would say, after you. Oh, no, after you. Oh, no, after you. Oh, no. You know, that kind of thing. It was a joke. But it was this dynamic that, can you imagine what life would look like if we esteemed others? Like, hey, maybe that parking spot, like, I don't know, like, looks like that mom has a lot of kids. This is kind of a selfish agenda right here. No, I'm just kidding. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh man, maybe that person has 18 billion things in their cart. I saw this the other day. I was at Sam's Club and this lady got right behind me and she had three things in her cart. But you know how Sam's Club's a little confusing? Because like you're supposed to put your cart on one side and you're supposed to get on the other. Well, she put her cart on the side that you're supposed to walk. And this guy with like two carts worth of stuff, she came up and just kind of stood right behind me where I was at the people line. And he just said, hey, how you doing? And I think she thought, oh, is this guy being fresh? What's he doing? And he was trying to, you know, in a kind way, say, you're cutting me in line. And, um, but she had like three things. And then he said, you know, it's okay. You go for it. Oh, there's a gentleman. He, you know, that's awesome. But that's like a simple, silly example of like people just, you know, I can wait an extra three minutes. It's going to be okay. I can esteem you over me. How do you have unity? This is what one of my mentors said to me. How did Jesus create unity? He died. And here's the biggest problem when there's a disagreement. But I'm right. Like, I'm not the one who's wrong. Was Jesus ever wrong? But he chose to die. In order for there to be agreement, someone has to die. And who will do that? Jesus. Jesus does it. But I'm right. I'm right. What if he would have said that from the cross? And this is the challenge of disunity with one another. Are you willing to die? To take the role of a servant? To not have to be thought much of? To be passed over? To not be considered? To be needed, not wanted? Then maybe you're following the path of Jesus. That's who he was. Did people really want Jesus? I don't know. If you consider much of his miracles and much of his teachings, and then when things got dicey, John was kind of there at the end with his mom. That was it. Everyone else bailed. Jesus said, listen, I'm, I'm here for God's glory and the good of others. That's the pathway to unity. The fourth thing that Paul writes here is that they esteem others better than themselves. David Guzik, a great Bible commentator, says this, that the Bible knows nothing of the idea that we should and must carry with us an attitude of confident superiority in every situation and knows nothing of the idea that this is the foundation for a healthy human personality. This flies in the face of much modern psychology. That in order for you to first, you must... The Bible knows nothing of the idea that we should and must carry with us an attitude of confident superiority in every situation. You know, the people that do well are the people that say, I don't know, but I bet there's someone smarter in the room that I can ask. When you're the smartest person in the room, you should exit that room. Does that make sense? Like, you should esteem others better than yourself. And lastly, fifthly, he says in this passage, let each of you not only look out for your own interests, but also the interests of others. One author wrote, if we looked into people instead of down on people, we would be filled with compassion for people. Like you don't know what you don't know. You know, there's that meme that always goes around on social media that you have no idea what, what challenges or what battle so-and-so is fighting or that kind of thing. None of us know everyone's story from the last five minutes or that morning of their, with dynamic with their kids or what that last medical report was from that time with the doctor. Listen, you don't know what you don't know. And I think this is so important. If we looked into people instead of down on people, we would be filled with compassion for people. He gives five steps to unity, and here they are. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Let nothing be done through conceit. 
and lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. Esteem others better than yourself. Repeats it there. And then let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but the interests of others. And then he says, having this mind among yourselves in verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What I like about this is he now gives us a perfect example of what it looks like to pursue unity. And who does he point to? It starts with a J, it ends with an S, and it rhymes with Jesus. Jesus, right? He says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And in the New Living Translation, he writes, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus has. You know, a lot of people like Jesus. Listen to what John Lennon once said. He said, I believe in God, but not as one thing, not as an old man in the sky. And I believe what people call God is something in all of us. I believe that Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said what was right. It's just the translations that have gone wrong. I'm thankful that that guy can put lyrics to a tune, but I could care less what he thinks about theology. He says, I like Jesus. Michael Jackson, this is what he said. I will never stop helping and loving people the way Jesus said to. He says, I like Jesus. Deepak Chopra says this. I like Muhammad a lot because he's like us more than anyone else. Jesus is just so exalted. Buddha is just so exalted. It's almost beyond our reach. He's like, you know, Jesus is there, Muhammad is there, Buddha is there. Katy Perry, this is what she says. I got this Jesus tattoo on my wrist when I was 18 because I know it's always gonna be part of me. When I'm playing, it's staring right back at me saying, remember where you came from. Like, man, I'm not like Jesus. He's like part of my history. Jesus does not call us to appreciate him, to educate ourselves about him, to debate who he is, he calls us to emulate and to follow him. Have you ever seen that meme with like Twitter and like Jesus is on a bench and the guy's on the bench and he's like, oh, I'm following you on like Twitter. He goes, no, I actually want you to follow me. Not just like, oh, I like that. I think that's cool. I'm going to share that. No, in your attitudes, in your choices, in your decisions, I want you to follow me. That's what verse five says. It's just like Jesus thought you should think. Oh boy. Well, how did he think? Look at verse six. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Even though Jesus had position, it's not what defined him. He willingly took the form, the place of a servant draped himself in humanity, emptied himself. What does that mean? Not that he emptied himself of his deity. It's not like he said, well, I won't be God anymore. No, no, no. But that he laid aside his privileges, gave up his rights. Hey, I can go last in the shopping line. (laughs) I can be the last to get the cup of water. It's okay. I can wait 10 extra minutes at this light at Oriole Beach that never changes. You know, like whatever the situation is, like, I can wait. I'm not the center. I I don't have to always get my way. Verse eight, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Let, Let me say that again. He humbled himself by the point of being obedient. I don't know if in most C's language, the word is obedient. What do you mean C's? Chief, executive, financial, whatever it is. Like when you meet individuals, you're like, well, I'm, I'm kind of in charge here. Are you? To whom are you obedient? Is it you? Or is it Christ? Those who cannot be led should not be leading. Those who have not learned to follow should not lead others. Because you are always under authority. You're under the authority of God. And he raises up leaders and brings them down as he sees fit. And the individual who has a problem with authority, ultimately their problem is with God. Because God is the establisher of authority. Authority is not your enemy. Authority is your friend. 
I learned that lesson at much cost. Authority is not my enemy. The enemy is my enemy. And he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and to twist, and to lie, and to deceive. See, Jesus, he gave up his rights as a servant. What does it say in verse 8? Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I just, I, this is amazing to me. Jesus willingly sacrificed his ability to meet his own needs. When he was hungry, remember that in the wilderness? And even tempted. He didn't budge. Jesus allowed himself and his human flesh to grow tired. Didn't have to do that. He even knows what it's like to lose. You say, what do you mean? When Lazarus died, he wept over the loss of his friend. Now, did he not know the future? Yes. But Jesus knew rejection. Jesus knew suffering. Jesus knew pain. Jesus knew hunger. Jesus knew challenge. You think that you're alone in your suffering. Jesus has suffered more than any other human possible. How do you know that? Because the full weight of humanity's sin was laid upon Jesus. The grotesque sins that we just go, let's not talk about those. Jesus said, I will take the weight of that on me. No other human has ever done that. No other human can. Born of a virgin. Live the perfect life. And died a death that he didn't deserve. He humbled himself by taking on our human nature for one grand purpose. To reveal the father's love through sacrificing his own life. You know, C.S. Lewis said this. The eternal being who knows everything and who created the whole universe became not only a man, but before that a baby. And listen to this. Before that, a fetus inside a woman's body. If you want to get the hang of it, think how you would like to become a slug or a crab. I love this. I love the, uh, just Lewis's little quote on the sanctity of life. But I also love this mindset that like, Jesus didn't just become, okay, I'll just kind of come down there real quick like Thor and like take away this sin problem and then we'll all be good. No, he came like a slug, born to a peasant couple who weren't married. So already he's kind of he's got the wrong foot in the door culturally. He doesn't know the right people, right? He's not sitting at the right tables. Jesus, you're born into a culture where this is like, this could get the mom killed. And this is how you come in? You need a better PR plan, you know? That social media feed is not going to grow that way. Like, and Jesus says, I'm here to be a servant not a celebrity. And then what does it say in verses 9, 10, and 11? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus is victorious. His victory over sin and death and the grave. Listen, that victory with sin and death and the grave and Satan was not like, okay, ready? Rock, scissor, paper. Oh, okay. Two out of three. Rock, oh, no. Jesus is victorious. It's not like there's still this game. Like, oh, the enemy, man, he sure seems to be rising up. Who? The one that Jesus took his authority, took his power, broke him. It's not like it's like Star Wars and there's the light and the dark and you're like, man, who's going who's gonna to win at the end here? No. Satan is a created being. Jesus is the uncreated one. He's master and Lord over everything. I like what one author writes. She says, Jesus was completely victorious over Satan on the cross of Calvary. 
There's no future rematches. No best two out of threes. It's final. Complete victory for Jesus. Anne Graham Lotz writes this, whoever or whatever sets themselves against Christ will sooner or later find themselves on their faces before him. Amen. I, I love that. So what is Paul saying? Number one, he's not saying, well, listen, everyone's just going to get saved. Some people take this text out of context and say, listen, well, it does say every knees bow, every tongue will confess, so everyone will eventually just go to heaven. There is those that would say that. There are books written by individuals like Love Wins that just says, you know, God is a God of love and eventually that's what will win the day. And I would say love doesn't win. Love has won. It, it's done. He has paid the price. But God is the perfect gentleman. He will not force himself upon you to receive salvation. He won't. He wants a relationship. So what does this mean? It's saying that every human being will ultimately confess that Jesus is King and Lord, either with joyful faith or resentment and despair. You know what it's like, like when your team loses? Yeah, that other team won. It's like that, yeah, Jesus really is Lord. This is what it says. Every tongue will confess. Those that elevate themselves will be humbled. Jesus is Lord, no matter what I think or you think. He's still king. See, a lot of people will say, well, I don't, I don't really believe in Jesus. I say, that's fine, he believes in you. Well, I don't, you know, I don't really think Jesus is God. That's okay, he didn't need your opinion. He still is. See, here's the deal. Jesus is the key to joy. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, we're learning this concept of a submissive mind. Say, so what do you mean by that? Well, in chapter one, we learn that the secret to joy in challenging circumstances is a singleness of mind. These circumstances are here to serve Christ. Therefore, no matter what happens, I have joy. Whether in life or death, good or bad, loss or gain, these are not my goals. Gain. My goal is Christ. Therefore, circumstances don't rattle me. Now, does anyone like live that way perfectly? No. The rest of all of us are like humans. Like, hey, we got to remind ourselves of this daily. But this is the pathway to joy. It's not that you like, hey, I graduated circumstances. They don't bother me anymore. I'm like, oh boy. Maybe lobotomy is in. No, no. Like, you know what I mean? Like, no, look, circumstances impact us all. But the way to joy is to remember. No, no, no. Circumstances come under Christ. I need to be reminded of that. I need to gather with God's people to worship his name. I need to group with God's people to connect. I need to go to live on mission. That's, that's how I remember these things. That, that's all of us, humans. And you don't graduate from challenging people. Oh, now I know how to be humble. Now I know how to pursue unity. No, this is like a daily fight with God's people. What do I mean with God's people? That when you're with God's people, and you're grouping together, gathering together around Jesus. And as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, elevating one another's needs above your own, ah, oh, unity is the byproduct. Unity is not the goal, Jesus is. And if Jesus is the goal, then unity will follow. See, in chapter 1, we're learning that Jesus is first, and in chapter 2, that others come next. And this is where we'll land this plane. You say, well, what, what about this, you know, this title thing? Listen, God's glory is the goal of life. The whole purpose of Jesus' humiliation and exaltation is the glory of God. That's Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. The joy of a submissive mind comes not only from helping others and sharing in the fellowship of Christ's suffering, like Paul will later say in chapter 3, verse 10, but from the knowledge of this very simple. If you've missed everything else I've said, catch this before we go. It is not about living for people. It is about living for Jesus by living for people. If you miss that one degree off, you will eventually get way off. What do you mean by that? 
This is what I mean. Maybe people aren't the problem. Maybe Jesus is. Say, what do you mean? People are broken. And they will be until they meet Jesus. Listen, Christians are still broken. Christian leaders, Christian parents, Christian kids, Christian businessmen. If I say, well, I'm here, I'm elevating, I'm helping them. People are broken and they're never going to be 100. People come second. Jesus is complete. He's always going to make 100. Jesus is first. Maybe we need to stop thinking that, well, I can't work with that person or I can't serve or connect or love with him or with her. Maybe what we need is a mindset of submissiveness to Jesus. See, maybe the problem isn't challenging people. Maybe the problem is with Jesus. I, don't, I, I really don't submit to him. Maybe that's where the problem is. That he gives us all these opportunities through challenging circumstances, challenging people to submit our will to him so that he can be glorified. But all we see is the problem right in front of us. Well, this circumstance, well, this person, ah, oh, you're missing it. You're missing it. Maybe what we need is a submissive mindset to Jesus, to love Jesus. How? Through that challenging person. Loving people is not an end unto itself, but it is the means to the ultimate end to glorify God. Because listen, you can't satisfy another person. You're not designed to. You can't fix them. You, you can't serve, 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 serve them to the point of, okay, now they're satisfied. That's called codependency. That's a problem. What you can do is point them to Jesus and say, listen, Jesus is the one who is your soulmate. I'm your marriage partner. I'm not the one to fulfill you. I'm the one to come alongside you. Listen, Jesus is the one who brings joy. I want to serve you, but even that service is not going to bring you ultimate joy. It's Jesus. See, maybe the problem isn't the challenging people. Maybe the problem is this mindset about Jesus. It's supposed to be for him. I'm supposed to point people to him. I love people because that is the way I serve him. Read 1 John. You cannot say, I love God, but man, I hate people. Then, the, then you would say, Jesus would say to you, then you don't love me. Do you want to know why? Because the church is the bride of Christ. If someone comes to me and says, Neil, I really like you, but man, your wife? I say, hey, bro, we got a problem. I like my bride. That's why she's my bride. So you don't want to like, the fast track to a fight is to pick on somebody's spouse, like their wife. Like I wouldn't like necessarily want to be in a situation like if Jimmy Falbo were here, and, and like Jimmy, if you don't know Jimmy, like he could probably kill you in 18 million different ways. You know, like he's like a karate. I would never want to come and say, hey man, let me just say this and this and this about his spouse. He'd be like, well, hey. He'd be like, oh no, I'm in trouble, right? But Jimmy, I like you, but that doesn't work. That doesn't work. You cannot say, I love Jesus. I just have a problem with the church. And let me tell you something. You don't love Jesus because Jesus loves the church. It's his bride. He loves people. And so if you want to love Jesus in a way that's meaningful, just make a list of the most challenging people in your life and start serving them. Oh man, this stuff is too real. See, Jesus is the key. In situations with challenging circumstances, it's imperative to have a singleness of mind. This is about Christ, not about me just getting out of this bad situation. In relationships with challenging people, it's about having a submissiveness of mind. See, it's this simple equation. Jesus over everything. Or it's this simple acrostic. It's simple, but simply profound. Jesus, others, let him take care of you. 
And it's even like spelled out in those letters, that like, like, you know, put on a little thing. Jesus. It's all only and always about him. So is the problem with Jesus? The answer is obviously no, like with the title of the message. But the problem isn't the challenging people. Perhaps it's that understanding that it's through a submissiveness of mind unto God and saying, listen, just like Jesus was, he didn't consider like his position something to hold on to. He wasn't passively, aggressively always putting people down. The way he loved his father was by saying, I'm going to take his drama, his sin, her shame, his pain. I'm so thankful he did. That he's given life and restoration and fullness and meaning and freedom and hope. Jesus is the key to joy. Live for him. Love him. Serve him through challenging circumstances and with challenging people. He gives you all these opportunities daily to grow, to mature, to develop, and to stabilize. Because in life, there's so many shifting foundations, aren't there? The way to have solidity is to make it all only and always about Jesus. To recognize that it's not the circumstance, it's not the person. I just need to see more of Jesus. I need to know him, be with him, be with his people, and allow those circumstances and allow those people to lead me to a place where I can serve him by serving them, where I can recognize that Jesus and Jesus alone is their savior, but I get to be their friend, or I get to be their, their doorkeeper, or whatever it is. But as you're the servant, that's when you're free. Just like Jesus, just like Jesus. Church family, as we close out this morning, I don't know about you. I think I do. I know a lot of you guys. But aren't you so thankful that Jesus humbled himself and went to the cross to die for your sin and mine? And so this is like this little simple title over this text. Have the same attitude as Jesus. That's how you do it. That's how you follow and find that unity is to be just like him by his spirit, by his grace, and to recognize that he's the key.